lecture series. I'm Alice Matripoli, Engineering and Medicine and Biology Society. Uh, I'm also with the Department of Biomedical Engineering at the University of Southern California. Uh, for those of you who are joining our series for the first time, this is an online series and is a new initiative in our technical activities portfolio uh, for the EMB Society and allows us to feature our lineup of distinguished lecturers uh, to our members all over the world. Uh, we welcome you to participate in real time in these events or enjoy the recordings after the live event. Um, I would like to extend a warm welcome to our speaker today, Dr. Georgia Tarasi from Oak Ridge National Lab. She's the director of the National Center for Com Computational Sciences and also holds faculty appointments with Duke University and the University of Tennessee. Um, our speaker's research is in the area of high performance computing and artificial intelligence and biomedicine, biomedical informatics, clinical decision support and data driven biomedical discovery. She'll be sharing her research with us as well as some insight into a career with the National Lab. Before we begin, I wanna remind everyone that we welcome questions and interaction. The way we do this is by submitting questions through the Q&A window in your Zoom application. And we'll ask as many questions as time allows for. Now, I would like to turn it over to Dr. Tarasi who will present her talk on artificial intelligence meets pre-exascale computing to modernize cancer surveillance. Thank you very much for the introduction and thank you very much for the opportunity to share with you um, my research work, uh, my most recent research work, as well as my uh, career path uh, from academia to a national lab, because I found out um, that this was uh, considered an unorthodox change and I have found it as a, an extremely satisfying career. So let me start. Um, Okay. We'll have problems with moving forward. Ah, it finally moves, right? So you see? Yes. My second slide? Okay, just making sure. So I will try. I will share with you my career path, uh, the current uh, research interests. And then I will focus on the specific uh, project that I would like to talk to you about, how we develop and deploy scalable artificial intelligence tools to modernize the National Cancer Surveillance Program. And I will conclude with a few thoughts, both on the research front as well as on the uh, career path. So as a timeline, I got my bachelor's degree from the University of Thessaloniki in Greece. Um, my bachelor's is in physics and with a minor in bi biophysics. And then I came to the US to pursue um, a graduate degree at the Duke University, a PhD in biomedical engineering because I was very much interested on the medical physics, biomedical engineering side of things. Subsequently, I had an um, academic career, mostly at Duke University Medical Center in the Department of Radiology, uh, as well as in the Medical Physics Graduate Program. And throughout the, those years, I had several interactions with colleagues from the national labs who were also involved in the same field of radiology, medical imaging as I was. In 2011, I joined the lab as a distinguished scientist to effectively build and grow the biomedical uh, sciences portfolio with a strong focus on the computational side of things. And there is a reason for that. The laboratory is very much known for its leadership computing facilities, and I will touch upon this uh, later. And then as it happens with every career, um, moved through the different stages. Um, I was the founding director of the Health Data Sciences Institute. Then I became group leader. And currently, as of uh, 2019, I'm division director for the National Center for Computational Sciences. We have 100, well, this needs to be updated, 157 staff members. And our annual budget is $275 million because um, this is a division that manages the computing infrastructure across many uh, programs and federal agencies, first and foremost, the Department of Energy. 
And I have maintained my academic connections, both with uh, Duke University, as well as I am a uh, joint faculty with the University of Tennessee, Knoxville, which is the local uh, academic institution, as well as the sister institution to the National Lab. So during my, the early stages of my career, during my academic career, the emphasis was on nuclear medicine, medical image reconstruction analysis. Um, that was early 90s, and that was the time that artificial intelligence started enjoying a comeback. Um, and that's how my postdoctoral work and my academic career um, focused primarily on the application of artificial intelligence for computer-aided diagnosis. That means uh, automated interpretation of the medical images for diagnostic, for prognostic, or for treatment planning um, applications. And of course, being a faculty member in a medical institution, the clinical translational aspect of the technology played a very important role uh, in my career. It's not about building tools, but it's also putting the tools in the hands of the users to make sure that they make the most of that technology. Um, the 90s was a defining decade in terms of building computer-aided diagnosis as a field that enjoyed a lot of uh, NIH uh, funding and NSF funding at the time, and also the, was the beginning of the technology uh, becoming an FDA-regulated technology. And that was, for those who have been in the field, um, a path that um, left many bruised and wondering what is the future of computer-aided diagnosis. The, two, the, the next decade was not as supportive of this uh, technology, uh, but uh, with the renaissance of AI and deep learning, we're seeing new air uh, breathing into that whole uh, domain. So what brought me to the Oak Ridge National Lab? Well, as I mentioned earlier, um, all of my scientific work was in radiology and the digital revolution in health started with radiology. All of these big medical imaging scanners collecting data uh, in a digitized format, other than, of course, the, the old fashioned uh, chest X-rays. Um, so the deluge of uh, information and data was already happening in the 90s uh, in, in radiology. And at the time, um, most of our computing was limited to not even clusters or small clusters at the time. And that begged the question, how exactly is the nation and the different domains prepared to deal with the, uh, uh, with the tsunami of data that we were dealing with? Well, right across the state from North Carolina in East uh, Tennessee, there was a national lab that was very well known for its computational capabilities. And for me, I was always intrigued that these two worlds um, did not really meet each other earlier. And that's what brought me to, to the Oak Ridge National Lab as part of the Computational Sciences uh, Directorate uh, to build and grow the biomedical portfolio, which was fairly, which was existent, but not necessarily a big part of the laboratory's um, portfolio. So this is our lab. The lab, as I said, is in Oak Ridge, Tennessee. This is East Tennessee, very picturesque area. Um, the lab is part of the Department of Energy. Uh, the Department of Energy operates 17 laboratories across the U.S. Uh, the Oak Ridge National Lab is the second oldest in the mix. The first one was Los Alamos, and it is often associated with the Manhattan Project. Uh, definitely, though, after the Second World War, the Oak Ridge National Lab uh, had no connections to the Manhattan Project, and it, is, it became an open science laboratory, and it remains the largest open science lo laboratory in the DOE system. The other important aspect of the laboratory, uh, most laboratories are known for a specific mission they have, a mission, of course, that is aligned with the mission of the Department of Energy. Um, the Oak Ridge National Lab is the largest 
multidisciplinary laboratory. In other words, we are involved in many um, different activities beyond what is expected, which is energy and material science. So these are some of our vital statistics. We have over 5,000 employees. Um, the laboratory has a 2.1 billion annual budget. And the budget is uh, driven primarily by the large number of user facilities that we uh, build and operate here at the lab. First of all, we are known for uh, the nation's largest materials research portfolio uh, and the nation's most diverse energy portfolio. In terms of the facilities, we are known for the leadership computing facility. We currently host the nation's largest supercomputer dedicated to open science. We have the world's uh, biggest spallation neutron source uh, facility. We have uh, the center of nanophase nano uh, materials. Uh, we have uh, one of the uh, biggest advanced manufacturing facilities. What that means is uh, that not only emphasizes the multidisciplinary nature of our lab, but also the service nature of our laboratory, because as I said, these facilities are open to researchers to come and do research and experiments on site that are not possible in, in other venues. So in my role, in my initial role, building the biomedical portfolio, um, we established the Health, Health Data Sciences Institute. And because this institute was firmly grounded into the Computational Sciences Directorate, the notion of leveraging supercomputing, high performance computing, advanced data analytics to, to deliver scalable and robust solutions, that was the cornerstone of the Health Data Sciences Institute. This is consistent with how the Department of Energy um, uh, pursues research. Uh, the Department of Energy is focused on grand challenges, challenges that have very long horizons and extremely ambitious projects. So in that respect, the uh, one of the uh, drivers of the Health Data Sciences Institute is how we can play the role of the honest broker for uh, supporting all the federal data assets, since the Department of Energy has a very well known history of being the steward of uh, large data assets from the nuclear side, as well as from the other sides. And we are well known for building and operating large scale infrastructure for the nation. As part of the Health Data Sciences Institute, we established four um, important collaborations and programs. Two of them, the one that are shown at the top, um, is, is a partnership, an interagency partnership between the Department of Energy and the National Cancer Institute. And the second one, the Department of an interagency partnership between the Department of Energy and the Veterans Administration. Both of these programs were announced with uh, the Cancer Moonshot Initiative, and they had a somewhat similar um, overarching goal. Uh, they were both under the National Strategic Computing Initiative that was announced by uh, President Obama with the goal to, uh, uh, for the Department of Energy to lead the National Strategic Computing uh, Initiative, working synergistically with other agencies. NIH was one of those agencies, NOAA, NSF, and so on. So how we can bring the unique computational resources that exist within the Department of Energy to support the missions of other entities, other federal agencies, such as NCI, VA, and so on. Similar efforts were in the area of opioids with the state of Tennessee, as well as with the Center of Medicare, uh, Medicare and Medicaid Services in terms of dealing with waste, fraud, and abuse. So that brings the story to the Oak Ridge Leadership Computing Facility. The Oak Ridge Leadership Computing Facility is one of the three uh, leadership computing facilities in the Department of Energy. 
two of them, one in Oak Ridge and the other at Argon National Lab, which is outside Chicago. They are dedicated to what we call capability computing. These are the two computers that are dedicated to the most uh, computationally and data intensive endeavors. There is also the uh, computing facility at NERSC, which is the Lawrence uh, Berkeley Laboratory, and that is known as um, a capa uh, capacity computing in the sense that it supports many smaller programs, primarily for, from the applied offices and the Office of Science within DOE. OLCF has been a global leader in HPC, in high performance computing, for 30 years. Uh, just in the past decade, um, we broke the petascale barrier for the nation and for the world. Uh, we introduced the first pre-exascale machine summit uh, in 2018, and that was ranked as number one at the time, just like Jaguar was, as well as Titan. And then we are uh, uh, very close to delivering the first exascale machine for the nation that is Frontier and that is expected uh, in the fall of 2021. This um, leadership computing is uh, one, a cornerstone in, uh, the, in the mission for the Department of Energy. And that is often something that uh, people are not aware that the computing mission, the high performance computing mission for the nation is owned by the Department of Energy. Therefore, it is a mandate for us to continue to deliver leadership computing systems to support open science. Um, just to give you an idea, the exascale means one uh, quadrillion uh, calculations uh, per second. So this is the way we can accelerate computation for the different programs we have um, available. Now, as I said, this is available to the open scientific community. So this is available to all of you who have interesting and exciting projects, and you can submit proposals for allocation of time uh, through the typical mechanisms. There is no cost. This is a service to the uh, community. But because we typically get requests that are five times of the compute cycles that we have available, there is a certain system in process in terms of going through submissions, meritorious review with uh, domain scientists across uh, the globe to uh, determine the ones that will be uh, accepted on a yearly basis. And we have three different programs that I will be happy to, allocation programs that I will be happy to provide more details as needed. So let me switch gears now to focus on the particular research project that I wanted to share with you, and that goes to the partnership with the National Cancer Institute. Since this program was announced as part of uh, the uh, moonshot, the Cancer Moonshot Initiative. This particular program is a partnership with four national labs and different entities within NCI. And that effort was structured across three different, we call them pilots, but these were three different, these are three different um, endeavors that capture the full spectrum from basic science all the way to translational science. Uh, one of them is the molecular uh, uh, level um, pilot, which is the middle one, actually, uh, the purple one, as you see in the graph, and it is all about understanding the pathways of the most aggressive uh, cat, uh, cancers, the ones that are driven by the RAS protein. So this is a molecular dynamic simulation type of uh, project. And MD simulations, for those who are familiar, are the bread and butter of high performance computing. So how we can do these simulations at a temporal scale that, is, that has not been achieved before. The second one was at the cellular level, um, focusing on preclinical screening, uh, analysis of PDX models and uh, cell lines to identify uh, promising therapeutic targets. And the third one, the one that I will focus my attention, is what we call the population level pilot. And this is how we can develop artificial intelligence solutions to support the National Cancer Surveillance Program. Actually, artificial intelligence and deep learning are the central um, 
technology components for these three pilots. And these were conversations that started more than six years ago between the two agencies. What brought the two agencies together was, as I said, the National Strategic uh, Computing Initiative, how we can follow the whole of government approach, bring, bring together agencies with completely different missions, but if they work together, they can advance their respective missions. So what's happening here is the DOE leans in with exceptional computational resources, computational experts, AI experts, to provide advances in cancer research. And NCI leans in with interesting problems to help the Department of Energy drive the next generation of hardware and software that is needed for our leadership computing facilities. And that's how we've been using these cancer problems to drive the exascale computing platforms. That's what has been helping us design and deploy Frontier. So when Frontier gets on the ground in the fall of 2020-2021, there will be codes, software, and applications in place to support from day one the scientific community that has similar needs. So in terms of what's happening with the National Cancer Surveillance Program, um, if you don't know, cancer is a reportable disease. Uh, it is reported in local registries. Um, and typically, the, uh, from the moment of diagnosis, when the particular cancer and particular patient is recorded into a registry, the individual is followed throughout, throughout the progression of the disease. It is important to capture that information. Since 1973, the National Cancer Surveillance Program, the uh, SEER program, has been um, working on this. Uh, covering approximately 30% of the cancer patients in the US with a very strategic sampling of the population to make sure that all um, types of can uh, all, all geographical locations or, or genders and um, uh, ethnic groups are represented accordingly. On an annual basis, there are 500,000 new cases and these cases are followed throughout their lifetime. So you can imagine, since age is the number one risk factor for um, cancer, um, and we have been quite successful in prolonging life with new treatments and with early diagnosis, the burden on the National Cancer Surveillance Program is huge because they need to follow many more people for much longer time than when this program was established. And this process of following the individual, collecting the information, um, is actually uh, manual right now because the quality of the information that needs to be collected is um, important. So how things start, the patient um, has a diagnosis, uh, the specimen is reviewed by the pathology who provides a pathology report, a surgical or otherwise pathology report that is submitted to the registry, the local registry where a certified tumor registrar reviews the report, extracts the necessary information and submits that information to the centralized SEER database from where there is integration of with structured data. And that in the end becomes the database that is available from the SEER program for the epidemiologists who want to do these studies. Now, what is interesting is that this whole process that I uh, showed there to from the moment of diagnosis all the way to that particular case to make it into the NCI CR database, it takes 27 months because this is a tedious process for the information to move through, for the information to be extracted, for the record to be created locally, to pass to, to the next level and so on. So when we're doing epidemiological studies, 
um, and we get the annual report from the American Cancer Society um, that gives the overall score for our nation in terms of how well we are doing in the war against cancer by measuring incidence, prevalence, mortality, morbidity across the different cancer sensitive groups and all of that. That information is based on two year old, that report is based on two year old information. Being able to have near real time surveillance is extremely important, not only because we need to have fresh information to make new management decisions, but also because there is this huge push for better clinical trials matching. So if we can have a system in place that can collect abstract information and look for appropriate clinical trials for the individual to be matched, this is going to be a huge win uh, for the national um, cancer management uh, system. So in terms of the pathology report, so what we said is like, okay, let's try to analyze the, the reports with, uh, with computers. Well, that is nothing new. Natural language processing has been around for a long time. There were plenty of studies showing at the time um, that the traditional uh, natural language processing systems are extremely uh, fragile because they are based on rule-based systems. And even for one type of cancer, one kind of uh, histology, uh, there are multiple ways a pathologist would express that. Actually, this is a very interesting study that was published in 2017, I believe, um, showing that for breast cancer and for one histology, invasive ductal cancer or inv invasive ductal carcinoma, there were they, they reviewed like 70,000 reports and they identified 124 ways a pathologist had used to express that, right? The same with DCIS. And then imagine negation, right? There were 21 ways according to which they expressed negation. So now if you're going to write a rule or a set of rules to capture all of these scenarios, you need to have 124 plus 71 uh, or uh, times the 21 uh, types of negation, and then add. There are 70 cancer sites. There are more than 500 histologies. So you can imagine that that system is not, the rule-based systems are not scalable. And that completely ignores the possibility of typos, um, uh, spacing errors, and all of these things that exist in the reports. So that was the time that we said, okay, what if we try to do it with deep learning? Um, because it is not feature-based. Yes, there are machine learning algorithms, SVMs, and all of these things that are done for us that were working decently, but still somebody needs to do the feature engineering and we want to capture that problem at a high scale. It's not like, oh, I will focus my attention on breast cancers for these three histologies to develop a system. That's the workflow we put in place, uh, bringing AI and HPC together, a, an end-to-end -end system where we can do plug and play of new NLP models as they come in, um, different deep learning models that were still happening and, and still continue. The, the field is moving with leaps and bounds the past several years. There were some other supportive techniques that were very important, how we do multitask learning, one-stop shopping effectively, how we can do active learning if we don't have ground truth, how we can develop solutions that are privacy preserving technologies. So develop that toolbox, what I call a toolbox to deploy the different um, solutions to uh, the national uh, surveillance program. And in, in, that, oops, in that effort, um, we have focused uh, in the past, uh, four years that we started getting the data from the National Cancer Surveillance on the different phenotypes that are based on site, subsite, which is topography, histology, grade, behavior, laterality, metastasis and recurrence. And now we're looking, we're looking into recurrence and biomarkers right now. Um, and the most promising of those tools that are, they are uh, shared back um, with the, the data owners so that they can integrate them in um, their workflows. Um, and just with the, I'm, I'm showing here some combinatorics, just with the 70 cancer sites, um, the 500 histologies, nine grades, seven lateralities, four behaviors, we had more than 10,000 cancer phenotypes to be, uh, that are observed with these five attributes. Not, not every combination is a possible combination. The other problem that we deal with these data sets, I'm giving you just an example, is how um, uh, imbalanced they are. 
Some cancers are extremely prevalent. Some cancers are extremely rare. So in the same data set, you can have hundreds of thousands of breast cancers and only a handful of some of the most uh, more rare cancers. And I'm showing you the distribution um, uh, in two registries, Louisiana and Kentucky. When we started this effort, we focused on CNNs, which at the time were considered a very unorthodox decision for NLP and clinical NLP. I will not spend time on that since I'm sure the audience is very well versed. We looked into different types of multitask networks because it all depends on what kind of ground truth you have. Do you have ground truth across all tasks or partial tasks? And we had scenarios for both and we needed solutions for both. Um, and we have published all of these things and you can find that. Um, this is uh, one architecture that seemed to work very well for us and um, I'm showing results to you. So with some uh, registry data that we received that they had some what I call bronze ground truth from the clinical abstract, we trained models and then uh, NCI took those models and they deployed them independently on other registries from their end and they shared the results with us, but agnostically, I don't know which registries they are or which cases. And here are some of the results, uh, the accuracy of these tools across registries that are shown as AA, BB, CC, DB, and so on. Uh, the performance across the different um, uh, across the different uh, data elements we extracted. Clearly grade and histology are the most challenging of the uh, extraction um, of the extraction uh, tasks. But we also showed that as we are moving from training the models with, with data from two registries to data from four registries, you can see that for histology and grade, the performance improves. So that supports what we all know that uh, with deep learning, the more data you have, you can uh, boost performance. Um, when we deployed these tools in the different cancer registries, there was also a, some a substantive benefit in terms of the workload reduction. It takes approximately 55 seconds on a study that it was side by side analysis, 55 seconds for a registrar to abstract these five data elements. It takes 12 milliseconds for, an, for AI to abstract the same report. The performance was comparable. Um, and because you know the the ground uh, because the uh, the registrar themselves are not uh, perfect, and we have been um, deploying right now new tools that allow these models to do what we call as a certain thing quantification. Not only provide um, a prediction, uh, but also provide a notion of how reliable they are for that particular uh, case report. And this is important because if we achieve high level of reliability, automatically the way to, to include these tools into the workflows is to use AI to filter out a certain chunk for which we feel very comfortable that the responses are accurate and then pass the rest to the registrars to help them accelerate uh, the process. And of course, uh, deep learning NLP is an extremely uh, exciting field with lots of things happening. We have developed and published uh, different models. And every time we develop a new one, we benchmark it with the previous ones. So we have the hierarchical attention neural network, the self-attention neural networks, um, uh, active learning. We have also done topological data analysis and graph CNNs with not very exciting results. And of course, we started uh, working with uh, BERT, the language models, which are all the rage. Now, what makes BERT extremely exciting to us is that they present some phenomenal parallelism challenges when it comes to the exascale machines, and they are compute and data hungry. Um, so this is a study that we recently published uh, where we tested some pre-trained transformers uh, across the same uh, applications the same tasks with the same data sets to show that you know the pre-trained transformers the ones that you get the uh, you know biobird and bluebird they did not seem to push the the frontier for us and it always comes back to how relevant are the training data with the actual case in hand when it comes to pathology reports pathology reports are long 
they are not short. So how do we deal uh, with length? And of course, they have a vocabulary that is captured, but not not completely. Also, same concepts can appear in different parts of the report and they could be related. So the length of the report is something that we are dealing with now to develop BERT models from scratch that are trained um, with pathology reports, clinical abstracts, and so on. Um, which means that we need to do a lot of hyperparameter optimization with these models because it's not like taking them out of the box. And, um, and we have developed uh, optimizers other than what exists in the literature. Actually, with the CNNs, initially we uh, applied a Bayesian optimization known as hyperspace that automatically um, simultaneously explore, explores many deep learning models every model you can fit one model in each one of the summit nodes which is the supercomputer you we're using um and just as an example you can see on the table below when we we started these conversations the supercomputer that was here available was titan and at the time some very initial preliminary uh, studies that we were doing for one cnn and with hyperparameter optimization um it was take for one cnn it was taking 16 hours and for with hyperparameter optimization, because it was an elaborate hyperparameter optimization, 266 uh, hours. Then we got the, the, the summit dev, which was like the pre precursor to, to summit, uh, so that we will familiarize ourselves with that architecture. And you see what tremendous gain that was. And running on summit right now, the same experiment has been infinitely uh, accelerated. And of course, there is also the question, do we need to do these calculations in full precision versus half precision? So here are some final thoughts. Um, there is much more going on in this effort. Um, I did not talk about recurrence. I did not talk about tools we're developing for cancer reportability so that we have these end-to-end -end solutions. But I wanted to give you a flavor of how uh, we are bringing together um, uh, artificial intelligence and supercomputing to develop tools that we can deploy and integrate in, in practice. Now, some final thoughts. What does it mean in terms of uh, leveraging AI for cancer registries? The hope has always been that the convergence of big data and AI will enable science. In this particular case, our hope is that it will enable near real-time cancer surveillance. Um, when you saw that, we go from 55 uh, seconds to 12 milliseconds. These reports can be analyzed faster to pass to the next level and the next level. Uh, so this is a substantial uh, improvement in time. And our initial studies um, from the field, they are showing that we could cut down to 30 days. Now, there is the hype always when it comes to AI. There is a hype that the AI solutions are uh, superior to collective intelligence uh, of the experts. Um, not necessarily. Um, uh, clearly, the quality of the output uh, depends on uh, uh, whom we compare it with. There are some registrars who are extremely experienced and other registrars who are not. Registrars are an aging population. It is not a desirable career path for individuals, so we see the need emerging in that field. Also, the practical translation of the AI tools is straightforward, which is a complete hype. We assume that if we develop this tool, this tool will be properly used by the individuals. And within the cancer registries, we find that every cancer register, uh, almost every cancer register has a different way they want to implement the tool in their workflow and a different way they interpret the output of the tool. So there are lots of conversations with the cancer registrars community, with the different cancer registries across the US to ensure that indeed um, we are integrating the technology in the proper way and it is used properly and consistently across uh, the registries. The hard truth is that regardless of what we're talking about, the AI solutions we're developing, they have a single point of failure, and this is data quality. So it is still important to train these tools with data that we consider of uh, 
good caliber. Now we are going back to many of the responses of the system that were considered um, that were wrong according to the ground truth. And in many situations, they were wrong. The system was wrong. But also we are finding many situations where we, the ground truth is wrong because the registrar, um, there is disagreement among registrars about this. And we're going back and other registrars actually agree with the tool that, um, with the prediction the tool makes, particularly when it comes to histology, because histology is one area where there's quite a bit of uh, disagreement am among the, um, the registrars. The human AI integration approach will impact real world value. And this is exactly what I spoke to. Um, we have to be very vigilant in the way we integrate these tools. Um, there is a question as to whether interpretability of the tools and uncertainty quantification um, are necessary. From uh, our experience working with the cancer registrars, uncertainty quantification is important to them. They need to know, they need to have a lever according to which they, they will trust the tool or not. And UQ, uh, uncertainty quantification, is a hot topic uh, for the AI community. How we can do uncertainty quantification at the single prediction level, not overall what is the reliability of the tool. In terms of interpretability, we know that this is an attractive topic that makes it into many publications because we want to make sense of what the tool does or how the tool thinks. Um, the jury is still out there whether interpretability is necessary. It may be necessary in the beginning to build trust in the system, but I believe um, from my prior experience with computer-aided diagnosis and radiology, if that trust is built, um, the user stop, stops asking why anymore. So this is something that I expect we will see in, um, with this new renaissance of AI and deep learning. And of course, there are lots of vulnerability issues, both uh, for the AI models. We worry about the sensitivity of the data. Uh, we should worry also about the sensitivity of the AI models and how vulnerable they are to in, uh, intentional or unintentional um, uh, attacks. Um, as well as we need to worry about the vulnerability issues on the AI users. Uh, there is what I call cognitive hacking in the sense that uh, we noticed that with the radiologists in the 90s and the 2000s that you give someone a crutch, they forget how to walk. So um, when we're inter integrating the human and the, the machine, um, we need to, to be able to make sure that the, the human still understands uh, his or her role in, in this. So I would like to acknowledge a very large team of individuals across different labs, across NCI, across CR registries that throughout the years they joined and uh, they uh, provided both data and expertise as well as being the guinea pigs for uh, testing these tools. And we're working, of course, with IMS, which is a third party entity that provides the infrastructure to the registries and um, we deploy our tools through them. Um, so let me close uh, my presentation by giving also some thoughts on my career. I started uh, in academia, right? All of my work was there. Then I moved to a lab to do uh, biomedical science, but now with a different lens, the lens of supercomputing. And um, uh, at the time when I made that decision, that was a very radical decision. People could not understand that. It was almost like a career suicide, how I'm leaving academia to go to a national lab. When I was going through graduate school, there were two options, academia or industry. Right? I was not aware of the national labs. Um, and I always say that these are my uh, principles um, that opportunity is missed by most people because it is dressed in overalls and looks like work. So it's, it's good to put hard work and your heart behind it. And that's where some of the best opportunities uh, are hidden. Opportunity dances with those already on the dance floor. So you need to be prepared and to be looking ahead um, 
uh, a certain level of being proactive. Sometimes uh, we tend to be too early in something and people will, will not embrace the idea. Um, persistence and resilience are important. And I learned that and I have not uh, regretted that part of the, of the fight uh, because it was a fight. And also luck is what happens when preparation meets opportunity. <laughs> um, so I often, um, I often, uh, I'm asked this question, you know, what is the fine line of being cynical versus optimistic? And I, I am an individual who, uh, who enjoys a good cynical joke, right? I, I am a cynicist. But I uh, fundamentally am an optimist, and I say that optimism is hard. It's a hard thing to do, but it's worth doing. So these are some of the lessons that I learned in my uh, biomedical career through that. So with that, I will allow me to spend one minute for a little bit of a pitch in terms of the careers that we have available at the National Lab. Uh, we have full and part-time staff positions available, R&D staff, technical staff, and support staff because it takes a village. We also often postgraduate research positions to post-bachelors, post-masters, and postdocs. Um, we have a number of different uh, internships that are either in the summertime or throughout the year, internships that are either through the Department of Energy or through some other mechanisms. I have them here. I'm happy to, you will have access to my slides and feel free to ping me. Uh, for any questions you may have. Um, I, we usually get the question, oh, it is a national lab. It belongs to the Department of Energy. You have to be a US citizen. No, this is not. A, there are certain programs that have these requirements. We are still an open science laboratory. And absolutely, um, uh, we have lots of we have 100 plus something different uh, nationalities uh, represented um, within the laboratory. And uh, if you want to look for actual opportunities, um, this is the website where you can find all the jobs. Um, and also, this is the link um, for the different internship programs we have. Clearly, the year of the pandemic presented some unusual challenges. Last year, we did not host um, any interns, not even virtually. Um, other than a few exceptions, individuals who were familiar with our environment and they could, we, we, we were confident that we could work with them remotely. But this year, uh, the majority of the programs have moved uh, remotely. But this is a website that you can uh, visit on a regular basis and you will see that we have internships throughout the year um, with different cycles. And with that, I believe I'm good on time. Thank you very much for the opportunity to share with you both my science, my career, and also to do the uh, recruitment pitch for, for talent to our lab. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing that. In fact, that was gonna be my first question if you didn't actually go, go through that. So actually you, you stole my first question about uh, what opportunities there are for the students that are, that are listening. Um, I think many of them are are eager to find out what opportunities are for their future when they finish up their studies. You know, they're very nervous at this time. And they, so it's fantastic that not only are there many opportunities available, some of them have moved virtually and it's open to uh, both US citizens and foreign nationals. So I think um, yeah. Yeah, uh, that I think is definitely great to clarify for our audience. Um, and, and actually, yep. Yeah, opportunities at all levels too, right? From bachelor yes, all the way and, through, yeah. Um, and I, I, I like to emphasize the undergraduate internships because uh, this is truly an opportunity to sample the space, right? You can do one summer in industry, you can do another summer uh, at a national lab or in academia, and you can sort of understand the culture, right? And of course that can continue with the graduate internship opportunities. Um, and uh, especially with the undergraduate opportunities, um, I mean, with all of them, there is a mentor, but with the undergraduate opportunities, there is a whole uh, infrastructure in place in terms of um, teaching the individuals how to write abstracts, how to, to present their work. There is a, an ecosystem of tools around, around these opportunities. 
And um, it is part of the DOE mission, workforce development, where we are supplementing what academia does with these opportunities, because sustaining a workforce, um, a STEM workforce for the nation is part of DOE's mission as well. Yeah, so there's some fantastic opportunities available. Earlier in one of the slides, you said there's you know 5,000 plus employees uh, at Oak Ridge, and then there's something on the order of maybe 3,000 plus visitors. So then are, are these visitors largely um, these interns, uh, you know, sort of visiting students and fellows? Um, is that is that sort of 3,000 plus number that program or is it's it different? All of the above, all, all of, the of them. Above. Because okay. we are a secure facility, it's not like you come knock at the door and you we open the door, right? There is a certain approval process. And every year, just like an academic institution, we will have speakers, we will have uh, visitors who come for collaborations. We have the interns, of course, we have faculty because we have also opportunities. I did not include them here, but there are op opportunities, uh, internships for faculty uh, to spend the summers. So all of the above. We That's also have a uh, high event. ratio. Yeah. Well, great. Um, so I think this is um, a, a really good insight into how a national lab operates and uh, the workforce development that is that it does, as well as the infrastructure that it uses to support uh, the nation's science. Actually, I found that um, you know your story about the computing infrastructure development, very interesting and how, you know, you started your project, you were on one tool and then you were on a development tool and then you had uh, more data with, you know, the most recent, which is Summit. Um, yeah, you know, I'm kind of curious, I'm not sure if others are wondering, but what happens when you move on from say, you know, from uh, Titan to, to Summit and when you go from Summit to Frontier, do you shut down an old facility? Do you just keep building? Actually, there is a period of overlap to ensure that um, the next system is fully operational. There are always some um, hiccups, you know, as with any system, but then the old system is decommissioned. We're talking about systems that are power hungry, right? And they occupy, you know, uh, a soccer field of, you know, space. So we need to be very mindful of that. Usually the cycle is every five years, there is a new system coming in that has been the, the cycle. Uh, but um, this is the first time that we have the most aggressive timeline, which is three years. And this has been extremely aggressive um, uh, for us and for the nation, right? Absolutely, so it seems like then you're always experiencing some level of construction related, oh, yes, to, yes. <laughs> related to well, facilities. Some some projects require, as you said, construction because the physical location is a completely new location that requires certain, not only space, but power, cooling. There is, uh, there is all of that logistics and others where you put it in a space where you have decommissioned an earlier machine, depending on what it is. Frontier is in a complete construction project because it's a beast. It sounds like it is, but it'll be very exciting once it's ready to go. Um, I'll remind the audience really quickly because I can ask many, many questions, but that you're welcome to post questions using the Q&A feature. Um, and so while we're waiting for that, I wanted to ask about you know, your work on the registries. Um, it seems like there are a number of stakeholders that contribute to that and that might use it. Um, and so you know, from you know, your perspective as being an employee in a DOE lab, and then working jointly with the National Cancer Institute. And those are in some ways very far removed from the folks who are at the front line, you know, the clinicians that treat the patients and so forth. And so how do you see that kind of the clinicians tying into that? Do you need to go back in and perhaps, and it's difficult to do, maybe change the workflow a little bit to um, speed up the, um, I guess, transport of the data into your system and also to deal with the, you know, the goodness of the data, you know, you mentioned the data quality um, as a big issue. And then on the other end, you know, who do you think are the different, the different users going to be? So we kind of talked about users a little bit uh, vaguely, but yeah. I'm kind of curious, you know, who do you really think is going to go in and use this tool that you're developing, the, you know, the, these uh, computational methods? These are great questions. Uh, clearly, this uh, specific application, our audience, our user audience are the registrars the cancer registrars who are 
members of the cancer state registries. Pretty much every every state has its own registry or every region, because in some cases it is a region. The tools by themselves, of course, could be deployed in other places. We are in conversations with cancer care centers because they also collect cancer cases and they do abstraction. Um, so the, these conversations with the cancer care centers, um, as well as with other stakeholders, other federal agencies that deal with a similar thing, CDC. A number of the cancer registries in the US are managed by CDC, not by NCI. The VA administration has its own cancer registries. So what does it mean to share these tools with them? Uh, this is open science, so absolutely we, we don't own the tools. Um, but because they are trained with sensitive data, right? They are not the identified data. NLP, deep learning NLP has some very interesting nuances. You don't share just the trained model, you share the vocabulary. And inevitably, names will seep in into the vocabulary or other sensitive data. So that's where we develop the privacy preserving models that we, uh, we can share. Of course, we can share with the other stakeholders, assuming that the registries that have contributed the data agree. It, it is not up to DOE. DOE provides the, uh, the computational expertise and the technical expertise openly. It's, it's the data owner who makes the decisions. So right now we are in conversations with CDC and the VA. They are executing the appropriate DUAs uh, so that they can take the tools to implement them in their own um, workflow. Now, how we share knowledge, there are three ways you share knowledge. We publish like everybody else, so our code is available. Like anybody can take the code from GitHub and train it with their own data, right? So this is one way of um, sharing. Uh, the second one, we share the trained models with the data owners because it's their models. We train, uh, we share the privacy preserving models, uh, privacy preserving trained models with whomever the data owners allow us to share. And as of um, earlier this year, we started a series of hackathons. So we have hackathons that are open to um, different users who would like to gain hands-on experience with these codes and try to run the codes on the supercomputing environment. So that requires, of course, a certain level of savviness in terms of understanding deep learning, understanding computing. But we went through uh, a hackathon as an experiment to see um, how that will go. It was extremely well received, and we will start making this a series of such events. The Leadership Computing Facility, uh, because it's a, as a user facility, has on a regular basis training events that 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 is given. I'm talking about the outputs of that specific project, having hackathons that are based on deep learning for NLP with a specific code so that people can understand how it is to take the data, clean the data, prepare the data, run the code, and all of that. So I'll ask one final question and, and we'll wrap up. Um, a lot of what you've talked about is really sharing within the nation. And you know, cancer affects everyone. It, it doesn't really care where you're from. And so I'm kind of curious, is there any conversation about sharing more broadly or collaborating more broadly internationally? So this is a very interesting question. Yes, there have been uh, multiple conversations, uh, particularly with Norway and uh, Netherlands and that part of the world in Europe mm -hmm. to see how we can combine forces. Uh, especially because we know that NLP, multilingual NLP, is a very well um, developed field. Uh, you won't be surprised to find out that everybody is interesting in interested in collaboration, but data sharing, data sharing across registries is hard enough. Across nations, it's even harder. But yes, we've had the conversations, we had the workshops, we had the back and forth. Um, I can say that right now there is something concrete in the plan. 
That, that's very exciting to hear. And I, and I know that there are all sorts of difficulties and details that have to be worked out to get the data sharing um, to, to, be, yeah. to be smooth and seamless. And I'm sure it's very far from that right now. Uh, but, you know, uh, Dr. Tarasi, thank you so much for sharing your research with us and also this amazing um, resource in terms of like internships and training opportunities at Oak Ridge National Lab. I think um, everyone has really benefited from getting this 360 degree view of what you do and also where you work. So thank you very much for joining us today. I appreciate that. Thank you so much for hosting me. Absolutely. Great. With that, um, just for everyone who is online, if you would like to rewatch, we will be posting the recording soon. So feel free to watch or share um, our program with others. Great. Thank you very much for joining us. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.